The Chancellor says spending on education will rise in real terms, but cuts elsewhere means schools are still going to have to make tough financial decisions. So how can they protect their staff and continue to provide the best educational opportunities for pupils? Welcome to The Big Debate. Hello. For the first time, this big debate is live and interactive, which means you can take part at home. Just sign in on the Big Debate Live page and you'll be able to join the online chat and have your say. We'll be putting some of your questions and comments to our panel. We'll also be asking you to vote on where you think schools should spend and where they should cut. There'll be four votes over the next hour, one taking place every 15 minutes. The first poll is now open and we're asking if financial pressures take their toll on staffing levels, do class sizes matter? So let's introduce our panel for tonight's debate. They are Sir William Atkinson, head teacher at the Phoenix High School in West London, Dr Mary Bowster, General Secretary of the Association of Teachers and Lecturers, William Simmons, Chief Executive of the National Association of School Business Management, Jenny Davis, the head teacher of Westborough Primary and Nursery School in Essex, and Dale Bassett from the Think Tank Reform. Over here watching proceedings is the Times Educational Supplements Opinion Editor, Michael Shaw. He'll be monitoring the online chat and will be letting us know what you're saying as we go along. Well, we already know that Teachers TV will lose its government funding in six months' time. But let's start the debate by taking a look at what else was announced in the Comprehensive Spending Review. Today is the day when Britain steps back from the brink. We have at £109 billion the largest structural budget deficit in Europe. There are choices, and today we make them. In stark terms, George Osborne gave it to us straight. The economic path we tread is a hard road, but he said it will lead to a better future. Difficult to imagine with cuts, cuts and more cuts being announced, and teachers, like everyone else working in the public sector, will not be able to avoid them. Yes, there will be some redundancies, and that is up to the decisions of individual employers in the public sector. That is unavoidable when the country has run out of money. Mere talks of increasing the state pension age has caused strikes all across Europe. Here too, announced the Chancellor, by 2020, the state pension age will rise to 66. John Hutton's report into public service pensions is also likely to suggest that the highest paid public servants will have to pay the highest contributions. We want public service pensions to be a gold standard. At the same time, we should accept that they must be affordable. When these public service pension schemes were established in the 1950s, taxpayers made half the contributions. Today they make up two-thirds of the contributions and the unfunded bill is set to rise to £33 billion by 2015-16. But education, along with health care and defence, has been singled out as one of the country's most important priorities. And therefore George Osborne said it's being spared major cuts. Although the entire department will have its budget slashed overall by 3.4% in real terms, the school's budget will be protected in real terms with a slight rise of 0.1%. There will be a real increase in the money for schools, not just next year or the year after, as the last government once promised, but for each of the next four years. Yeah. <clears throat> The school's budget will rise from £35 billion to £39 billion. Even as pupil numbers greatly increase, we will ensure that cash funding per pupil does not fall. We will also sweep away all the different ways in which money is ring-fenced so that schools can decide how best to spend their money as they see fit. A £2.5 billion pupil premium wanted by both coalition parties before the election will be introduced to support the education of disadvantaged children. This, the government says, will give schools a real incentive to take pupils from poorer backgrounds. The educational maintenance allowance, however, handed to disadvantaged 16 to 19-year-olds has been scrapped. Free education is to continue for all three- and four-year-olds and sure start the community outreach programme set up by the government to give children the best possible start in life will be protected. Fifteen free hours of early education for disadvantaged two-year-olds is also being introduced. 
As was already announced in July, the Building Schools for the Future programme has been cancelled. In its place, the Chancellor revealed £15.8 billion will be spent to maintain, rebuild and refurbish 600 schools. The resource money for schools, the money that goes into the classroom, on the broadest definition, including all the main grants, will go up in real terms every year. George Osborne is promising that a stronger Britain starts here. But what do you think? So lots to discuss. Let's look in more detail first at what the changes will mean for teachers in schools. Sir William, well, we heard the Chancellor say the school's budget is going up. So presumably, none of you are going to have to cut anything. Well, I, I don't think that's quite true. I think the direction of travel is n broadly neutral. If, if you take into consideration the growth in pupil numbers over the next four years or so, if you factor in the pupil premium, we don't know what the pre uh, pupil premium will look like, but we know there's a global sum, then it, you, you we're more or less where we are now. Uh, later on. So I don't think there's been a big increase or a significant increase in funding for schools. I think it's neutral. But I think we ought to be grateful given the, the, the climate we're operating but in. But will you, will you have to make savings in your school? Well, uh, in, in common with many other schools up and down the country, we're looking very hard at every budget in our school and we're looking hard to make sure that the budget is doing what we want it to do and we're using the resources as effectively as possible. So we're going through that rigorous exercise now, based on the figures that we're, are now available to us, some schools jumped the gun, in my view, and started doing some kind of dr draconian proposal, 10%, 25%, got, getting their staff kind of hot and bothered and under colour. We've taken a measured view. OK, M Mary Bowston, I mean, what we heard today from the Institute of Fiscal Studies is that if you factor in inflation, in fact, there is a per-pupil cut uh, over, over the next uh, four years. That is going to mean schools having to make cuts, isn't it? I think that schools are going to have to make cuts over the four, next four years for what Sir William said, for the very reasons he said. I've just looked at the Institute of Fiscal Studies figures tonight and I need to examine those further. But if you take in the rising pupil numbers over the next four years, I would say that they, that they, they, they could be right. Schools are going to have to make cuts, but remember schools will also be making uh, big savings. Uh, teachers got a 2.3% pay rise next year, but then it's a pay freeze for the next two years. Now, when you take into account that staffing costs are by far the biggest proportion of any school budget, you've already got a massive saving there. So I don't think that we should be looking at um, really fighting talk at the moment. I think we should be, as Sir William says, steady in our approach. William Simmons, do you think schools will have to look at headcount? Staffing is such a massive proportion of the school's budget. I'm, I'm, I'm sure they will, and, and we are aware that some schools are already doing that. Um, whether, whether it's right at this time to, to, to start looking at that sort of uh, way forward is, is debatable. But if it's 80% uh, of your money, 80%, you, you're going to be looking at staff when it comes to making cuts, aren't you? Oh, that's, that's got to be one of the, the obvious places to go. It's, it's the largest cost centre in, in the budget of any school. Um, but what we're saying is that uh, it, you know, there are ways of making staffing cuts without actually going down the road of talking redundancy, uh, which has, has been happening in some schools. As they've taken that as the first resort rather than the last resort. And uh, I think they've got to study the, 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 right. the facts and things. Well, so first. what that might mean, Jenny Davis, is natural wastage. Now, one of the questions we're asking online tonight is, is do class sizes matter? If you lose headcount, you're going to be looking at bigger class sizes, aren't you? Part. You're going to be looking at losing teaching <coughs> assistants and all, and all of that. I, I think if you've got an inclusion agenda, the children are obviously supported in the classroom, particularly the very young ones by their teaching assistants. It's not that easy just to get rid of staff. And I think certainly in the primary sector, we are down to the bone. In our particular school, we have not got a management structure. Um, we've just got senior managers and no one else. So if you, if you do lose support staff, teaching assistants, yeah, we what will be the impact to. on education? Uh, I, I would think that uh, you won't be able to have the inclusion agenda as it is because the demands for those children and the others, the demands are so great. What do you mean the inclusion agenda? Children with special needs being integrated from our community into their local school. Okay, well we'll pick up that more in yeah. more detail. But Dale Bassett, I mean, you, you perhaps don't share that view. 
Um, I don't share it entirely, but I think the very important thing to recognise is that every school is not in the same situation. In fact, far from it. Different schools, different pupil cohorts have hugely different needs. Um, and one of the things that I think we really need to do here is make sure that head teachers have the flexibility to do what's right for their school rather than sort of imposing unilateral changes across the board. Right, but I mean, but, but, but if you look at the, the basic question of losing staff, w would you say it is as bad as Jenny would say? Um, again, I think, I think it's going to depend on the school. That said, I think in an awful lot of schools there are classroom assistants um, who are used essentially because the government has made money available for them. But you've talked uh, about overstaffing in classrooms, haven't you? Do you seriously think classrooms are overstaffed? Um, uh, we, we've actually got the smallest class sizes that we've had for a decade because we've been massively increasing the number of staffing classrooms. We've now got 10% more teachers than a decade ago, two and a half times as many teaching assistants as a decade ago. Yet during that period, pupil numbers have fallen. So actually on average we've got much much smaller class sizes now than we had a decade ago. So William do you recognize this picture? Not really. I've been teaching for 40 years and I don't recognize that. I mean they had to teach of three secondary schools. Uh, I, I do agree with the point that you've got to take context into consideration because if you're running a comprehensive school in a leafy suburb where the vast majority of the young people turn up every day ready to learn and are keen to live by the rules and regulation, I think that's one scenario. If, however, if you're teaching in another situation where there are many children from many different nationalities, many languages spoken in the school with multiple deprivation as an everyday reality, the staffing requirement for school number two can be very different from school number one. So what we must be careful about is not to generalise and, you know, use a big brush Well, Jenny, you, you, you were pulling an interesting face when, when Dale was talking about, uh, about the number of, you know, the, the, the pupil-teacher ratio. Um, I, I think that we've got it about right. Obviously, we used to have much smaller classes, interestingly enough, and then they were made up to 30. Um, and that is, I think, just about right. And I, I really think it's, too, in a way, in many situations, it's too many in a class at primary level. Mary Bowstead, I mean, do you, do you, I mean, you're all, you're all being sort of fairly, look, it's, it's early days, we may not be looking at job losses yet. But going forward, you must see this cutting up rough in some form. Well, I think that... As Over I, the next four years. I, I don't really see that we can say at the moment that that is actually going to happen. I mean, as I said before, teachers are taking a two-year pay freeze. Next year they get 2.3%, then they're taking two years of a pay freeze. So staffing costs... And they're going to have to pay more towards their pensions as and well. And they're going to have to pay more towards their pensions. Yeah, it's, you know, there are difficult times ahead. But staffing costs for schools will be a constant. Now, that's the biggest driver of change in, in the school's budget. But will there teachers continue? Constant. I mean, will, will teacher goodwill still be there? when you say, as you say, they're having pay freezes, they're going to be losing more of their income going into their pension, they could be losing other support elements within their school that are funded out of other pots of money, their jobs could get harder, they could be doing more well, for I'll less. Tell you, I'll tell you, truthfully, I'll tell you what will really get my members very annoyed. They'll, they actually took the pay freeze. What will get them very annoyed is if the government looks about with their pensions. Right, OK. Well, let, let's go to see what's happening um, online. Mike, um, what, what, what are sort of people... Um, commenting on. Lots of discussions about uh, teaching assistants, which may be a subject we'd move on to later. Um, it's actually quite philosophical uh, thoughts on teaching itself and whether money really, really does help what teachers do in the classroom. Uh, Louise Teacher Conway, LEA, writes, every resource, be it book or smart board, is as good as the teacher using it. And David Rapp asks, is more money really the answer? Um, but the one subject they're quite keen to talk about is, what about the big cuts to FE? This is also unfair. We've had quite a few people ask that. Uh, well, it's not necessarily what, we, what we're going to concentrate on tonight, but, I mean, do, do you want to just pick that up, Mary? Yes, I do. I mean, the, the, the funding for FE is flatlining, but we know that far more students are going to FE, and uh, we're already seeing huge cuts in the FE budget. The educational maintenance allowance is gone, um, so it's going to be more difficult for um, students who are from poor backgrounds to carry on in their education. Uh, we're seeing lecturers being made re redundant. We're seeing adult um, education being slashed. And there's no doubt, for a steady budget for schools, one of the areas which is paying for that is FE. And that does raise a question um, for those students who want to go on doing uh, vocational education or the sorts of courses you do at FE, when the job market is so policy poor for them, what's life going to be like for them? OK, let me bring in a couple of other online questions just, just coming in. John asks, what about the loss of EMA, the Education Maintenance Allowance? How much effect will that have? Dale Bassett. 
Um, I don't think actually that the educational maintenance allowance was a particularly effective way of spending more than half a billion pounds of the education budget. Um, there's, uh, there's evidence to suggest that it has a little bit um, of impact on, uh, Kept a few on, people on, on, on people coming along. But not worth what, it. No, well, well what, what it didn't actually do was improve educational attainment at all. Um, and you did have a huge deadweight cost because, of course, in the majority of these cases, they're kids who wanted to stay on past 16 anyway. Um, so actually, I think the government's decision to try and target some of that money more effectively is probably the right one. Another question that's just come in. What's going to happen about the support services that are vital to children, such as parent support advisors and extended schools? William. Well, I mean, extended schools um, is something that's uh, been, it's a program that's been there for some time and, and uh, quite a few schools have, have gained additional funding through, through that program. Uh, we encourage it um, because it, it is something that school business managers appear to be quite good at and um, they seem to be able to manage that situation and, and bring in the additional funding which is as I is expected of them. Jenny? It's very much an integral part of our day, the extended schools, because we start school very early. Um, and our first lesson is at 8 o'clock and the end of the day is the lunch hour rather than the middle of the day and then we have extended school facilities which are 27 clubs a day with 470 staying just from our school so I think those type of things will impact on the community around and I think even discussing um, further education for primary schools it's quite the impact is going to be from the parents into the schools. Okay, well look, we, we, while we've been talking, people have been voting at home, and let's go to the first vote, which was on whether class sizes matter. Uh, let's have a look at the results. It's coming, I believe. There we are. So, uh, yes, smaller is always better, overwhelmingly, as the result, 77%. 11% say no, a good teacher can manage, and 12% say it depends, a teaching assistant can help with a large class. But overwhelming uh, concern, I suppose, uh, that class sizes uh, should not get, uh, get bigger. There's another vote going up now, and there will be a new question every 15 minutes through the course of this programme, so do keep taking part in those votes, and we'll have the results later on in the programme. Yeah. I completely concur with that. If you're thinking about assessment for learning, if you think about personalization, you do need a, a, a number of youngsters where you can actually do that with, yeah? And the idea of having these very large numbers would defeat that. But I must say the most important thing is a very good teacher. Because if you've got a poor teacher with a class of 10, that's not going to do it, yeah? So, the, you know, the, 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 the priority must be to get outstanding teachers working with our young people. And if you've got outstanding teachers working with small groups, then you can sure. have quantum leap in achievement. All right, well, let's drill a little bit further into the funding settlement and what it really means, because there's still a lot of confusion uh, around this tonight. One of the key election promises from both uh, parties in government was the creation of a pupil premium, money which would directly target pupils from deprived backgrounds. Now, the Chancellor has announced it'll amount to two and a half billion pounds. But is it new money or is it existing education grant money simply recycled? Let's take a closer look. Visiting a junior school in Derbyshire last week, Nick Clegg described how the comprehensive spending review will provide an opportunity to boost fairness and the life chances for the poorest with a pupil premium. A pupil premium to help poorer pupils wherever they live in the country. Schools will receive additional funds to offer targeted help to every pupil eligible for free school meals and reduce educational inequalities. By the end of the spending review period, this pupil premium will grow to an additional two and a half billion pounds of investment each year. But where will the money for the pupil premium come from? Is there an extra pot of cash for schools or will money be recycled from within the education department's budget? In terms of the pupil premium, obviously that's to be welcomed as a very progressive move to increase funding in deprived schools. Um, but the overall budget being fixed, more or less, would suggest that they are moving money from one part of the system to another. But that would still be a beneficial thing to do if it meant that funding in deprived schools was at a higher level to, to reflect the fact that teaching children from very deprived backgrounds uh, is potentially more challenging and requires more resources. 
On the Channel 4 News blog, reporter Cathy Newman suggested that an examination of the figures makes it appear that the pupil premium is not new money. She said the figures only add up if the pupil premium is included in the budget, not added to it as the Lib Dems originally hoped. So will schools be better or worse off? And is the Department for Education giving with one hand and taking with the other? OK, let's talk more about the pupil premium. Is it new money or not? And will the pupil premium make schools better or worse off in reality? Uh, Mary Bowster, what is your understanding? Well, I had a long discussion with the department yesterday and I was assured that uh, the education grant would remain flat with a 0.1% increase over the next four years and then the pupil premium was extra. But today it appears that that, um, that uh, narrative has been changed by people looking in detail at the figures. Now, I need to go back and ask again, actually. Uh, at the moment, the jury's When you look at the bald figures, it doesn't look like there is any new money. That's right, that's right. Um, and the, my understanding is that some of the money for the pupil premium has come from um, FE and post-16, but we need to look at where else it's coming from as well. Dale Bassett, in reality then, doesn't that mean that some schools are going to do pretty well out of the pupil premium and others are going to do disproportionately badly. I think that's probably exactly what it means. Um, the question is which are the schools that are going to do well and this feeds exactly back into Sir William's point earlier about the different needs of different schools um, and particularly into staffing levels. Now what you're going to find is those schools that actually do have high numbers of pupils from disadvantaged backgrounds, uh, perhaps not with English as a first language, with various kinds of deprivation, those schools are going to get a lot of extra resources to make sure that those kids get the help they need. Uh, the school in the leafy suburb with the kids who basically do quite well on their own probably are going to see a fall in their budgets. To so they're, they're going to face serious cuts? They probably are. What's going to be the impact of that, Swoon? Actually, because we know so little about the pre pupil premium, we don't know what it is, we don't know how much is allocated to each student, nor do we know whether it replaces existing additional funding for depri deprivation, which a previous government introduced, yes? So if it was £2,000 and a, a secondary school could be getting 12 to £1,500 uh, £1, at the moment, the extra 500 is not this quantum leap that we're led to believe. So it really does depend on how much it is and how it's allocated. And the allocation is important. I, I noticed Nick Clegg made reference to free school meals, which is a very crude and blunt instrument. Mm -hmm. For instance, I think it's something that you trigger free school meals around about £16,000 income in a family. Now, it, it's just maybe just over, just under. If a, a parent has got one child and underneath, just underneath that 16,000 threshold, they're entitled to free, free school meals. If they've got an income of maybe 17,000 and they've got four children, they're not entitled. Mm -hmm. So you're not really getting at deprivation if you simply use school meals. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, this, this means, Jenny, I mean, schools are, are, are really, I mean, schools within a matter of a couple of miles of each other, mm -hmm could find themselves in dramatically different circumstances. Yes, that is exactly right. And we are in dramatically different uh, situations now already. Some schools are able to carry forward a lot of money and uh, it, for whatever reason, and there are other schools who are struggling every year. So this isn't new to a school like ours because we have to address all of the issues mentioned every year before we set a budget. Dale Bassett, how is this going to actually play in then? Given, we, given the uncertainty around it, to, to dealing with pupils with special, with special educational needs and, uh, you know, and, 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 and the need for yeah. special services? Well, I, well, I mean, there's, there's, there's separate funding for special educational needs um, in, in terms of uh, children with, with what you might call learning difficulties. Um, but in terms of, of children who just need extra help in the classroom, um, you know, then the idea will be that this pupil premium funnels money much more efficiently than the current system. The current deprivation funding is an absolute mess. There's plenty of money there, but it doesn't all go to the right places. Um, what, the, what the pupil premium will do will attach that money directly to the individual pupil who actually needs it. Now, as long as that goes along with a head teacher having the freedom to spend that money in whatever way they want, that could be paying more to hire the best quality teachers, it could be reducing class sizes if that's what they want to do. But as long as the head teacher has the freedom to spend that money properly, it could make a difference. 
Mary? Well, I'm just a bit concerned about this head teacher freedom, which Dale keeps going on about. I mean, one of the things we don't know in terms of school funding is once, when, when the money's actually gone into a school, there's very, very little research, very little knowledge about how schools actually spend it. And I do think that the government and, and uh, as a nation, we need to do more about what is effective spending in schools and what might be effective ways to support uh, children who uh, suffer from deprivation. I mean, uh, I mean just to talk this mantra about, well, let the head decide, you've got some very good heads. I'm afraid you've got some who aren't very good. We do need a bit more than, oh, it's the, indiv the, the school budget, it's the individual feet of the head and they can decide. In reality, how much leeway do you have? Well, we have considerable uh, leeway, which is right. You know, if you look at school budgets, they could be somewhere between uh, secondary, uh, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve million pounds. Now, this pupil budget uh, premium will be a small ele element of that. We're already trusting our teachers and governing body and senior staff to use effectively that eight, nine, ten million pounds. So therefore, I think it's entirely consistent that this money ought to be allocated to school for the school to determine the best way of, 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 of supporting the young people in question. But some schools, you know, there is research. Some schools use it effectively. Others use it far less effectively. As you say, it's 10, 12 million pounds. It's a lot of money. We have a right as a society to know what are general trends in spending of effectively and to make schools more accountable for where they spend do, their money. Do you think we will know, w w William Simmons, um, which schools are spending it well and which schools aren't in, 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 in the new landscape? Well, I think, I think currently you, you can already do that. I mean, there is a financial management standard in schools, which is, if it's properly assessed, and, and generally it is, um, you, you can actually see which schools are, are managing well and which ones aren't anyway. Um, I think um, my concern at the moment is, is more, I mean, there, there, there's a report in the London Evening Standard this evening uh, from the uh, Independent, Independent Fiscal uh, Studies, Institute of Fiscal Studies, that says 87% of secondary school pupils in the next... Uh, in, over this next four-year period will be in schools with less funding. Well, part, part of the problem is obviously the different ways funding comes into schools. It doesn't come up in a, you know, it come in a, in, in a simple, nice, not, you know, not nice uh, you know, one-lot check. Here's a question from, uh, from Dora online. I work in a deprived area and our authority has just had an £8.4 million grant for deprivation taken off us. The pupil premium will nowhere cover that loss. Dale. Uh, well, I, I mean, obviously, I, I, I don't know about this specific um, situation. Um, what William is absolutely right to say is we don't know um, the entire landscape in which we're going to be seeing it. We don't know exactly what's going to happen to existing deprivation funding. Um, so, I mean, there, there is, if, if it's the case that the pupil premium is actually going to replace a lot of the existing deprivation yeah. funding, then that will cause a lot of upheaval yeah. in the short term. Um, I imagine that the government will want to look at ways of, of trying to, 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 to mitigate that, um, that impact uh, in, in the first couple of years. Do you think this has been well, well handled in terms of clarity for schools? Um, I think Especially Mr. after building schools for the future <laughs> and those schools who thought they we, were being... we, we, are, we, are, we are definitely missing a lot of information at the moment. Uh, the Department of Education says it's going to publish a business plan next month, so hopefully that will fill in some of the, the very many gaps that we have. What are people saying online? Are there, are there any questions coming in we should put to our panel? Um, lots of questions coming in around the people premium. Um, there's a great deal of cynicism about free school meals as a benchmark. JJ Thomas talks about it as a crude benchmark. Uh, one of the teachers writes that most of our pupils who need extra help in the classroom are not eligible for free school meals, so we're going to lose out pupil funding for these pupils. And Holly Taylor asks, how will it be ensured that the additional money from premiums gets to those who need it? Well, that's my point, really. You see, I think this comes, the pupil premium comes to the heart of the contradiction in the government's policy. They say, we're going to get this money for deprived pupils. Then they say, just roll it up into the school's grant, and then schools can spend it how they yeah. will. There have to be some measures to actually uh, ens be ensure that the money is spent properly for deprived pupils, because otherwise there's How? no guarantee. Through inspection? Well, yes, maybe. More I don't know. Yeah, well, uh, or through, no. through the reporting system by, by which schools report how they spend the money. There has to be some checks and balances. The government says, right, we've got this money for uh, deprived pupils, and then it says, as Dale says, let the heads spend it how they will. Some heads will spend it well, 
Others won't. Well, there has to be some checks and balances in the system for what is a vast amount of public money. It wouldn't be the last thing we need is more bureaucracy yeah. in schools. We're trying to shed some of that stuff so we can get on with working with the young people and raising standards. Account there is considerable accountability in the system at the moment. You've already mentioned Ofsted who come in and they look at value for money. That is part of what they actually do. And they make judgments about whether it's outstanding, good, or just satisfactory or inadequate. So that's going on. In addition to that, we're all subjected to every two years to audits from their uh, outside organisation to check that our procedures are in place and are fit for purpose. So there's a lot of uh, accountability in, and I don't want us getting bogged down with more bureaucracy. That's one of the features of the epoch we just moved from. We want to get the resources and allow to get on with the job and we need to be accountable. I'm, I'm up for that. But we don't want unnecessary accountability. Jenny? The um, latest round of deprivation subsidy that came out just prior to the summer I thought was really good because it, we had to link it to individual, the unique pupil numbers had to go in so an, a particular pupil, you put down their number, you could track the money going to them. It was a really good system. It wasn't overly bureaucratic. Those, mm. those uh, numbers exist for children anyway. It's like a pin number. Every child's got their own already. And it just was very effective, very quick, and very, very, very good system. Right, well, uh, you, you should also be, uh, be looking at our online questions. And we're, we're on the, the, the second question uh, at the moment, which is, uh, which is how best to spend the pupil premium. And I hope we'll be able to go to that re result um, shortly. But just give us a bit more of what people are saying in terms of the online chatter. Uh, one of the questions we've had is from Brian Lightman, who's the General Secretary of the Association of School and College Lecturers. And he's asking, what do you believe is the role of local authorities and which, if any, education services should they continue to provide? Who wants to pick that up? Well, the LAs are very much into commissioning now rather than providing and also to ensure that all schools play by the rules and for uh, areas like special education need, make sure the needs of those young people are, pr uh, are properly catered for in the different schools and they get the opportunity to access all of the schools, not just those schools that might have difficulty in recruiting. Right, OK, let's go to uh, our next vote result. And we've been asking you the best way to improve the quality of new teachers. Here's the result. Right, well, uh, raise the bar for PGCE training, 15%. Recruit top graduates for short term. Well, nobody thinks that's a good idea. Do more in-school training is overwhelming. Uh, your, your choice. 74% of people voting for that, uh, with 11% uh, of people saying make teaching a master's level profession. So the best way to improve the quality of new teachers is to do more in-school training. Um, William Simmons, is there going to be the money to do more in-school training? <clears throat> I think that's the, the way forward to, to, for training in the future. I mean, in, in up-to-date, a lot of the uh, professional development is done outside of the schools. Uh, there's travel costs, uh, etc., to attached to that. Um, and certainly, I think it's got to be done more in-house. Certainly, we provide more in-house than, than we've ever done uh, previously. And that will cut down the expenditure uh, that the schools have been investing in the past. So, yes, it is the way forward. Do, do you think, realistically, when it comes to recruitment, uh, any squeeze on uh, bottom line is going to affect the quality of candidate you can go for? Are you going to have to go, or schools going to have to go for cheaper staff? Well, I would hope they wouldn't, to be honest. Um, <clears throat> I think you've, I mean, in, in, in the teaching profession, obviously you've got to have the right quality with the right qualifications. Um, and we consider it the same with uh, a lot of the support staff, with, with school business managers. We actually do say that they should uh, aim towards a, a master's level degree. Uh, but certainly they need cer certain uh, accredited uh, programs to, to be able to satisfy that, uh, which again, both the National College and ourselves are, are, are providing. But if you, I, I always think it's a bad mistake if you just say, well, I can only afford so much and therefore I'm going to take that person on because what's the, the benefit going to be uh, by taking that route? So I, I wouldn't recommend it at all. Mary, what, what do you think your members' concerns are going to be with regard to recruitment and the impact of the spending review on, that, on those sorts of decisions? Well, I mean, we're already concerned about recruitment. Um, some figures that came out just last week showed that 
uh, over nearly half the um, students who qualified for the PGC last year still haven't got a job. So already schools, I think, have been making decisions about not employing uh, new teachers. But I'm very interested in that, um, that response, where the majority of the respondents said in-school CPD is really important. And I think that's absolutely right. But it's not cost-free. Yeah. If in-school CPD is done properly, then it involves release time, time for teachers to work with one another, and time actually to have reflection, proper reflection, on what you have learned uh, from each other. So no one should think that's a cost-neutral um, uh, uh, expense for, for schools. But the other very interesting thing about CPD is in the white paper that's coming up um, uh, in, in November, I'm pretty sure the government is going to say uh, that teachers should have an entitlement for CPD. Now, what that will look like, I don't know. But one thing it will create is a cost pressure in schools because some schools do CPD very well. In other schools, it's a Cinderella. Uh, teachers are appointed and they don't get good CPD. Well, it's likely that very soon teachers will have an entitlement to CPD, and that's long overdue. What about all these new teachers who are coming out uh, with, 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 with new qualifications, Dale? I mean, half of them are unemployed from last year's... Uh, cohort. Um, uh, well, are, we, are we training too many? Uh, well, I mean, that, 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 that may have been the case, but I mean, you know, we're expecting pupil numbers to increase over the coming years, so we are going to need um, more teachers just, just to maintain the, the, the ratios that we've got at the moment, um, as far as that's concerned. Um, but I think Mary's point is absolutely right. Um, the, the, the value of CPD in schools is absolutely key, and she's absolutely right to say, you know, this isn't cost-free, this is going to involve a trade-off, and this is going to mean hard decisions for head teachers. Um, you, we are going to have to start looking at the issue of quality versus quantity. You know, it, it may in some cases be a case, well, do we actually want to shrink class sizes by a couple of pupils, or do we want to make sure that we've actually got a first-rate teacher in every class who has access to all the CPD they need, really understands the best practice, the best pedagogy, and is delivering the best possible education for those children? Do you recognise those trade-offs, Sir William? I think that's a reasonable statement. In my, uh, from my experience, the quality of new people coming into the profession has never been better. That's fantastic. I think in terms of teacher supply, it depends very much where you are in the country, uh, and it depends which subjects you're advertising for in a secondary school. If you're going for mathematics, if you're going for physics, if you're going for chemistry, if you're going for modern foreign language, you will find great difficulty in uh, being able to create a short list of, a short list, sorry, of sufficient quality. So so it's very difficult to generalise too much because I think that could cloud the issue rather than uh, shed some light on it. A lot of people in the new uh, administration are very keen on the sort of the teach first model. Uh, for, for creating new teachers. Do you think that's something that could be realistically right. scaled up? Teach first to... people. I've never used them. are great. They're very good, but so are the teachers who are coming into the profession through the traditional route. You were looking sceptical, Mary. Well, teach first do do a good job, but I mean, it costs an awful lot more. It costs about 38000 to train a teach first trainee, which is much more than actually through the more traditional routes. It has its place, but it's not a program which could scale up to uh, produce the 30,000 teachers we need every year in order to uh, replenish the profession. And, and uh, what, what, what do you make of, of the attempt to raise the bar with the masters in teaching and learning? Um, I, I mean, is, is that at odds with everything that you're saying here, that actually the best way to... Yeah, to, to I, raise I, standards is in the classroom? I don't think that, that the Masters in Teaching and Learning is, is the solution to suddenly making every teacher great. Um, I mean, it, it really isn't going to have that effect. It's about actually getting that quality CPD, which normally means in schools. It's about you know, teachers actually realising what the difference is between being a, a great teacher and being a sort of a satisfactory teacher. Um, I, I, I don't think, and I mean, there's been a huge amount of criticism of, of, of the MTL in any case, um, but I don't think that actually just getting another piece of paper is really going to turn a satisfactory teacher yeah. into into a great but none of, none of this conversation about professional development is saving us money, is it? Uh, no, it's not, and professional development costs money, so we're going to have to find the savings elsewhere. But the debate is about raising standards and, and assuring the highest levels of attainment for our young people. Yeah, but and the reality is to do about. that in, but the, you have in a to smaller do within, envelope. You, yes, you have to do it within whatever financial envelope you're working in, but those are the main, the main drivers. How are we going to raise standards above that which we've already achieved? If you look at our, co uh, our competitors, international competitors, they're raising standards as well. So although we've done very well in recent recent years to, ra to raise standard more, more or less across the board. You look at our international competitors, they're doing likewise and some are doing better than we're doing. So we've got to raise our game considerable if we're going to stay in, this, uh, in the marketplace.
I, I, I agree with what's being said. What concerns me is that we're only talking about the, the, the teaching profession when there is an awful lot of support staff who should equally have uh, continuous professional mm. development and, and are not receiving it. And if they were to get the professional development as well, that would aid uh, the, and, and support the uh, teaching well, profession. But a lot of them are for the job, aren't they, in the real world? I mean, yeah. you know, well, none I, of you want to cut <laughs> teachers. You all want to spend money on professional development. Where, where's the pain going to come? It's going to be in the support staff, isn't it? Well, it's not that easy. No, I mean, a lot of support staff are necessary in schools. But, I mean, I think it's not a case of cutting. It's a case of looking, OK, if, you've got, uh, if you're losing some staff, you, you may not replace them. Um, and, but a school is going to have to take that decision and, and, and be able to understand what the implications will be if you don't replace that particular member of staff. I mean, if, if you took a premises manager, for instance, and you're... you're you, you lost them or, the, or, or, or they uh, decided to go of their own free, free will, it, it, it's still got to be replaced. Um, We've had a point from Morris, who, who's an education recruitment consultant, saying heads need the training in business management. <laughs> Well, I think they do, uh, but uh, I mean, equally, you ha we have to accept that it's not really the role <coughs> of a head teacher. And I've always said that, that heads and, and governors need an understanding of the, the business management. It, it, it's not something that they need to get involved in on a day-to-day -day basis. You should have a school business manager, or if it's a, a, a primary school, they, they have the opportunity to get a cluster of, uh, together and, and uh, employ one school business manager. But heads do need to have an understanding. If you've got a balance sheet put in front of you, you need to be able to read that. Mm. But yeah, it doesn't but mean I mean, to say you've got to work on it. The thing is, it isn't just a matter of a balance sheet, it's a matter of actually seeing what outcomes you're getting for the resources you're Absolutely. putting in. Yeah, now, we're all talking yeah. about how staff and mm. make up 80% of the cost of schools. Mm. How many heads actually are looking at the value for money they're getting in terms of educational outcomes mm. from where and how they're deploying those staff? Mm. Not very many, and incidentally, the, the accountability that exists, like Ofsted's look at, looking at value for money, does not look at that, yeah. and to my mind, that's right. the most important value for money measure we should be looking at. The Audit at. Commission do have a, a resource tool on their website that schools could use to actually establish that. And, and there is not a huge traffic using that particular Absolutely. tool. So it, it's available to them. So William, what do, you, what do you make of this idea of heads getting more business management skills? Well, I've run three secondary schools. I've not got a business degree, but I've got uh, a good understanding of what goes on in a, in a balance sheet. And I also the relation, know the rela understand the relationship between financial uh, issues and educational performance. And I think that is, as Dale's already said, that is a crucial link. So I do look, and many people, there's nothing special about my practice, many head teachers I know look very carefully at their resource, they look very carefully at the, uh, the outcomes that they're looking for, and they look to, f uh, to fund those activities which are, the, in their view, the most productive in their context. Jenny, a question for you. How, how will taking two-year-olds into the education system help deprived families. Who's going to create spaces to take these children and who's going to fund it adequately? Well, we're all looking at that. I and mean, we've gone full circle, actually, because at one time we did take two-year-olds and then we were uh, prevented from doing so. So I think that we are looking at that and I think it's right and proper if the right... Um, if a mother wants to work and, that, and we're being told constantly that uh, these mums must be out and doing, then there has got to be proper childcare and I think a school is well placed to provide that as long as they've got the right support in place. Well don't forget for the first time this big debate is live and interactive online which means you can take part at home. Just sign in on the Big Debate Live page where you're watching this and you'll be able to join in the chat and have your say and of course I'm putting as many of your questions and comments to our panel uh, as I can as we as we go along. Uh, Mike what are people saying? Um, lots of discussion about teaching assistants and support staff and the role they can play. Uh, some teachers concerned that they'll be used increasingly as a cheap option in schools, cutting budgets. Uh, but Sam Roblet writes, you cannot have the same level inclu of inclusion without additional support staff. Uh, which raises a big question. Well, I mean, that, that brings us back to, to, to a point you were making, Jenny, uh, with regard to teaching assistants. So, I mean, let's just focus on that for a second. I mean, how is this an area that is not going to be one that falls victim? When you look at how your teaching assistants come to your school, certainly with us, most of our teaching assistants come because we have ch children who are statemented or are allocated by right that extra support in the classroom. 
And that is something that, as a head teacher, I have to make sure I have in place. Otherwise, the litigation will be there from parents, and quite rightly so. Then you have the need for a teaching assistant for very young children, because obviously it doesn't make any sense to have a teacher doing up shoelaces all day or blowing a child's nose at the cost that they are to a school when somebody who um, has a different role in the school could be doing that. Mary? Um, I do think there's been quite a lot of research which says that um, schools, particularly in secondary schools, the deployment that they know least about is what teaching assistants do in the classroom. Um, and uh, in fact, Ofsted said that. Ofsted did a report two years ago which said, in fact, um, the work that, that uh, support based uh, workers did in the classroom was something which was a bit of a black hole. Schools didn't really know what was going on there. So, again, uh, teachers find their support staff immensely valuable. So I know that support staff have made a huge difference to working in schools, but I do think that um, support staff and teachers need more time to work together, and I think support staff need a lot of better CPD, particularly classroom-based support yeah. staff, so they know how to support learning. There's an idea, I think, in some schools that just the fact that support staff are in the classroom makes it all right. Mm. It doesn't. It's, it's all about the interaction between the support staff and the teacher and the work they're doing together. If that goes well, you can do an awful lot about children with learning difficulties. If it doesn't, then there can be a lot of adults in the classroom without a clear role. Right, well, you've been voting on how best to spend the pupil premium. Um, let's have a look at the result. What's the best way to use the pupil premium, we asked. 41% of you said on support staff, the very thing we've been talking about. 18% of you said extended services. 5% of you said one-to-one -one tuition. And 36% said training for teachers. Dale Basson, what's your reaction to that? Uh, I, I think those are really interesting figures, actually, um, and I'm surprised that the, the figure for training for teachers is so high and the figure for one-to-one -one tuition is, is, is so low. Um, I think, I mean, you know, as we were discussing earlier, the reality is it's going to come down to the situation in the individual school, and there are lots of circumstances in which support staff are useful, particularly when you're dealing with children with SEN, particularly um, in the very early years, reception, maybe year one. But what's also true is that in the rest of the school system, there's a lot of support staff who have cropped up due to all this extra money sloshing around who don't really add a lot of value. The one big study that has been done on this, which was by the Institute of Education for the Department for Children's Schools and Families, as then was last year, which is a massive cohort study, basically found that the majority of teaching assistants in the majority of classrooms do not add a lot of value. More than half of teachers um, have not had a substantial boost in their productivity or job performance, in their opinion, and only a quarter of teachers have found that they've been spending substantially less time on the kind of routine administrative tasks that teaching assistants were meant to take away from. Sir William Atkinson. I think we've got to be very careful when we generalise about teaching staff, uh, support staff. Mm -hmm. I know many support staff who do a, a thoroughly good job. But I think the point that was really being made by Mary, that we need to ensure that our teachers are well trained, the same applies to our uh, support staff. Mm -hmm. They need to be well trained. And also teachers need to really be continuing their upskilling through CPD all the way through their career. That's important. And one of the things we need to look at, if we're going to get the best outcome for our children, not only do we need to spend the money in the schools, but we need to create the space for the teachers to do the training and most of that increasingly is in school so we need to look at the number of training days we allocate at the moment they're five and there's a case for going to six or seven in, ter in terms of getting the best outcome for the children Dale if you look at these results what people are saying do you think there is a gulf between where the profession is and where the policymakers at the heart of government um, oh, I, going. I, 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 I don't think there is because I think the government um, has also got a, a, hu a huge focus on class size and on staff to pupil ratios. Um, I would argue that that is the wrong focus to have generally and that you know, in certain situations, as we've been discussing, that is important. But broadly speaking, it, it is wrong for policymakers to impose that as a unilateral direction of travel when actually in a lot of cases that isn't what's going to make the difference compared to teacher quality in the classroom. OK, well, let, let's move on then to talk about school buildings and investment in resources. Now, one of the most dramatic cuts 
was the announcement in July that the £55 billion Building Schools for the Future programme, BSF, was being cancelled. Some schools will still be rebuilt, but the decision on those is under review. So in the meantime, can and should schools raise their own money for repairs and new buildings? Dale? Um, well, for a start, they don't all have to raise their own money. I mean, the government has allocated £16 billion over the next four years for capital spending, which incidentally is more than was spent over the first five years, I think, uh, after 1997, when the Labour government came in. So, you know, it's not like there's suddenly going to be no money to spend. The difference here is the money's going to be spent where it's needed. Building schools for the future was a colossal waste. There was just a decision made that every single school in the country, whatever state it was in, needed to be rebuilt or refurbished. If we're going to spend money on capital investment, let's spend it on the schools that actually need it, the schools where there are leaky roofs, the schools where there are walls falling down, because those schools exist and that's where we should be spending the money. Mary? Well, I think that's profoundly misguided. I mean, building schools for the future was not just about building new schools. It was, a, it was about a vision of uh, educational provision in the 21st century. And I always think this is really interesting. You never hear uh, those um, uh, owners of private schools or those who teach within them not boasting about the new lecture theatre or the new drama hall or the new science lab. Uh, and for too long, we have said to our children in state schools and to teachers who work within them, you're very important, but actually we're going to send you into an asbestos-riddled, damp, um, uh, you know, horrible place to work, and, but, but you're still very important. And actually what BSF did and the ambition to rebuild or refurbish every secondary school and primary school was to say education for all children and for all teachers and particularly those who the state educates is important and this is a physical sign of it. It was mu about much more than just plush new buildings. Dale, do you want to come back? Um, I, th I think the vision of education for the 21st century should be the best possible quality of education happening in the classroom, which starts with the best possible quality of teaching. I think £55 billion is a colossal sum of money. It's, it's, it's more than what we spend on the entire school system in one year. And to say we're going to do that just as a sign to pupils that they're important, well, I think actually having great teachers in the classroom that are going to get them motivated and engaged in learning, that's going to get them... Yes, but you have, to look, at, you have to look on. at why that programme was needed. That program was needed after years and years and years of complete neglect, criminal neglect of school buildings, where, you know, there was, you know, in the last year of the Conservative government, they spent something like 68 million on, on school, on the whole school estate. It was a complete uh, travesty what was done. And, and uh, teachers and pupils were left in buildings which anybody else would have been condemned under health and safety absolutely. laws. We, we, a which, huge which, amount which needs is to be done. Absolutely so, William, you've been trying to get in. Yeah, it's not like me to shut up, but <laughs> I, I managed to. I absolutely think it's, it's right that uh, the environment that young people receive their education in should be fit for purpose. And there were some really grotty, dilapidated buildings being used by children from a very early year, years, uh, age, and that's not on. However, the Building Schools for the uh, Future, as Mary has already indicated, was, was about more than simply building. It was about a joined-up vision uh, for the future. It was about schools working together, collaborating together, sharing uh, uh, resources in a way that was innovative. However, having said that, the, uh, the uh, program was com uh, complex, it was highly bureaucratical, and it was full of waste. So the fact that it's been scaled down significantly in itself is not a bad thing. It's what we do with the money that's been left, uh, uh, left in the pot. And if the 16 million is simply to fund new schools, then it could, 16 billion, there could be real issues for those schools who have got leaking roofs, uh, asbestos, et cetera, et cetera. William Simmons, I mean, schools are going to have to get more entrepreneurial. I mean, how, how are they going to do it? What do they need to be doing? Well, yes, I, I, I'd agree with your comment there, um, and, and I think a lot of a lot of schools already are uh, in, in in that uh, description. Uh, I think um, I mean school school business managers now we expect them to bring in more money than than they actually cost, um, and schools are doing it, uh, or school business managers, schools generally are doing it by uh, bringing in sponsorship. They're they're looking at all the possible grants. Uh, school down in the West Country just recently, new school business manager, only been there for a few weeks, had brought in quite a substantial sum of uh, money through sponsorship, and still continues to to uh, to look for different grants, for sports facilities, clubs after school, etc. So it is possible to bring in the additional funding, but it's, it's 
it's actually getting the school business manager or whoever uh, has that responsibility to, to really spend the time and research where that, that, that funding can come from. How does that sound to you, Jenny? Um, I think it's really, I th obviously I think it's a really um, good vision, but I think in primary we're less equipped to actually uh, have that role. I think we are moving towards it, but in most schools, the primary do not have the facility of a, bus uh, of a business manager, and I think they should have. Uh, we're looking to join up with another school to actually recruit that kind of person, and um, I think that's the way forward. We definitely need this now. Yeah. I mean, I suppose, Mary Bowsted, what, what you might have had uh, under a, a previous system uh, would be, you know, somebody at a local level who has an overview of all the schools in the area, uh, is involved in the funding, somebody a bit like an LEA perhaps. Um, now their role is obviously being <laughs> shrunk uh, in, a, in, a, in a lot of schools. Now what's going to be the impact of that? Well, I, the demise of the LEA has been repeated again and again and again. And uh, actually New Labour weren't that keen on them and uh, the Conservative, the Coalition doesn't seem to be that keen either. But I actually think if you don't have a local authority, you'd have to reinvent it one way or another. And I think they will have a new role, a revised role. Uh, it can be around commissioning, although I do have real concerns. I mean, we're already... Um, the, the where I'm really concerned is that uh, where are schools going to go for those support services that local authorities provide? I'm thinking of uh, people referral units, uh, uh, child and adolescent mental health services and a whole range of other services where we're already getting indications that there are already those posts being cut. Dale, what do you see as the the future uh, role of the LEA, if any? I, th I think the reality is that many, not all, but many local authorities waste an awful lot of money and incidentally they top slice the budget that goes to schools in order to, to spend that money. Uh, they're taking money away from schools in order to spend it centrally, which is fine if they're spending it well, but it's not if they're spending it badly. Now what academies can do um, is take that money themselves and decide how they want to spend it to make sure they get value for money. It's not going to be right in every case necessarily, but there's an awful lot of local authorities across the board that, that aren't spending that money well and putting it in the hands of schools might mean we can get better value for money for it. And they're not cost effective Mike. on service level agreements either, are they? Mike, let me come to you. I mean, what, what, are, what are people sort of saying online about this particular area of sort of well, capital on, investment and... On local authorities, local authorities. just had a comment that local authorities are essential to stop schools squab squabbling, which uh, seemed quite <laughs> accurate. Um, on the school buildings, a few have um, echoed what Dale said about quality teaching being more important, um, but very strong comments from teachers about how the classroom environment has helped them with their pupils. Dora wrote, for some children, the only clean, warm place they know is their school. Of course, buildings are important. And Mel Melvin Thomas writes, it's no good having ICT if it gets wet. Dale, I mean, you know, nobody, no, nobody wants to say, you know, you, you, should, you should learn in cold, leaky classrooms. No, and, and, and as I said, I mean, we, we, should but, we should absolutely be spending money on schools, but let's spend it where it's actually needed. You know, I mean, the, 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 the horror story that, 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 that Mary paints is not inaccurate. I mean, that, you know, that, that was but true do you, of I mean, given, given, given the cuts to the capital spending programme going forward, the reality is surely... In three or four years' time, we are going to see children in leaky classrooms with schools yeah, again, who don't yeah. have budgets to do anything about it. I think, I, I think if, if the government's looking to spend £16 billion over the course of the next four years, that's quite a lot of money. I think particularly given the huge amounts that have already been invested in, in BSF. And incidentally, BSF started, uh, it, it was designed in order to start with those schools that needed it first. So the worst schools have already been dealt with, uh, which means I think that £16 billion you know, sh should hopefully be enough over the, over the next four years. If it's not then you know perhaps schools do need to get more entrepreneurial. I just want to squeeze in the last the last vote uh, of, uh, of, of tonight. You've been voting on whether school buildings affect learning. Here are the results. Pretty predictable I suppose. Yes overwhelmingly a good building says we respect you. 12% say no teaching is all important and 10% say depends if roof isn't if roof isn't leaking it's okay so you can shiver but uh, but you shouldn't get wet. 22% of people saying the buildings don't matter is surprisingly high isn't it? Very best. Um, I do think that's surprisingly high actually yes. Um, I think teaching, I think Dale is right, the, the single most important indicator of the success of a school is the quality of the teaching but the quality of the teaching is supported by all sorts of other things and a good building sure yeah. helps. Yeah. 
especially if those children come from deprived background where their home environment may not be the very best. So to mm. go to a school which is clean, which is warm, which is conducive to learning, which is stimulating, which is engaging, is very important. Mm. And more important for them than maybe my own sons and daughters who come from a slightly different background. How, how, how optimistic are you? over the next four years? I'm very optimistic. I'm very optimistic because mm. I'm working with some great professionals. I'm very optimistic because I'm working with some fantastic children. So that's a lot of scope. Jenny? Yes, I would say the same. I lead a very, very um, professional team. That's my teaching assistants as well. We do as much training as possible. I look forward to the future. And it better be good because we've got a, a lot to do. Well, on that note, uh, we must leave it. My, that's it for this big debate. Uh, my thanks to our panel, Sir William Atkinson, Dr Mary Bowsted, William Simmons, Jenny Davis and Dale Bassett, and, of course, to Mike Shaw, who's been, uh, who's been busily reading everything that you've been saying online. If you want to continue the debate, you can follow us on Facebook or on Twitter, if you want to contact me direct over Twitter, you can get in touch with me at Chris GM. Don't forget, all our videos are available to watch on the website. That's teachers.tv. From me and all of us here, bye-bye.